You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hanning here with fellow panelists, Valerie Niemeyer and Christopher Zender. Today we discuss Catholic social thought and economics. That means taking a long, hard look at capitalism as practiced and the dominance of corporations as dominating. We'll explore the nature of usury and what's at issue in a fair wage. We'll consider the state as a political community and the family as the cornerstone of social justice. We'll want to talk about personal responsibility as the foundation of the social order. Our welcome guests, and we have a number today, are Thomas Stork, the editor of Money, Markets, and Morals, this year from En Route Books. And its Australian contributors, Dr. Donald Boland and Dr. Derek Small, as well as the American distributist thinkers, John Midday and David Cooney. Let's begin, as we always do, in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who have taught the hearts of the faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that in the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Since the panel is dealing with a panel, uh, we'll try to do so in an orderly fashion. I'll begin, and and I'll ask uh, Thomas Stork, the editor of the volume in question, uh, to answer the first question, but others can answer that uh, in a different way. And then when we go to the second question, well, I'll ask Christopher Zender to ask that question. And anyone can join in, raise a hand. And when we come to the third question, I'll ask Valerie Neumeyer to ask that question. And if you think we have prepared questions, well, of course we have prepared questions. Uh, we'd run off the road within a minute if we didn't have prepared questions. However, the preparation is uh, an ad libitum sort of thing. People are free to come and go and, and linger. And we don't countenance vaping, but if some people aren't going to insist on vaping, we'll, we'll allow for it. So I'll begin with the first question. And this is basic, and I think a whole lot of people don't ever consider it. Uh, Catholic social teaching, that's basic moral theology, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's moral theology as uh, dealing with our interaction with others, especially on, <clears throat> when it comes to the economy. And you can define Catholic social teaching in a couple of ways. You can, and Pius XI in his first encyclical, um, Bobby O'Connell talked about it, and he gave a broad definition having to do with the whole question of Catholics and the state. But usually when we talk about it, we're dealing with the narrower question of the economy. And um, that's what the, the book is about, and that's what we usually mean when we say it. But, but the... The moral law does not cease to operate, obviously, when it becomes a matter of uh, action by more than one person. It's not somehow merely an individualistic moral law. And But as soon as we join with others or get into some kind of a combination, somehow the moral law ceases to uh, have any validity. So that's that's why we can say, yes, Catholic social teaching is, is a part of moral theology uh, as, as, as regards our interactions, especially in the economy that we're talking about. All right. Now, uh, John, are you, you, you weren't waving at Don. Welcome, Don. You weren't waving at him. You were putting up your hand to add to this question. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I would like to add that, in a, in a way, uh, social justice is, is, is a redundancy. 
because all justice deals with justice is, deals with your relations with the world. And so all justice is social justice. Uh, the term wasn't introduced until 1841 by Father uh, Taparelli, um, and it was adopted in 19. Um, uh, 31, uh, 1831 ad adopted, yeah, um, 1841 adopted in 1931 in, uh, by um, uh, Pius XI. Uh, and and um, he used it nine times in his encyclical, and that's when it became um, part of Catholic social teaching. But it only became, we only needed a social justice because justice had been privatized. OK, by modern economics and by modern moral theories. Uh, so before that, the term wouldn't have made any sense at all Okay, before the modern era. Well, but we have to remember that there are different kinds of justice. There is commutative justice, distributive justice, legal justice, and very often social justice is considered to be. But social justice is just the application of those three kinds of justice to institutions. Well, uh, my understanding was that social justice is actually legal justice or legal justice considered under a certain aspect or, or a portion of legal justice. Well, I would also include distributive justice in, and certainly commutative justice in social justice because both of those have social aspects. So certainly distributive justice, which is the just wage is part of distributive justice. Well, in Divina uh, Rita, in, in exchanges is certainly has a social element. Yeah. Well, in Divina Rita Torres, Pius XI makes the distinction that the worker is due a living wage and commutative justice. And then he goes on to say, therefore, social justice, there is a duty to organize the economy and the institutions of the economy such that the payment of a, the commutative due wage is possible. So he's making the distinction there between the commutative justice due and then social justice which makes possible the uh, carrying out of the commutative justice. At any rate, I believe that Tom and John would agree with me that we distinguish in order to unite. We distinguish in order to unite. And uh, Christopher? Yeah. Maybe it'd be good at this point because I think any of those who might be listening to us are going to ask themselves, what, what do we mean by commutative justice and distributive justice? And even before we ask the question I want to ask is, what is how do we define capitalism? It's probably good to lay down those definitions because I think the questions that we, when we address capitalism, we're going to have to bring in those distinctions again. So if someone would like to lay down those definitions, I think it'd be a good thing. Well, I can tell you, started at distributive justice, simply the d distributions from a group to the members of a group. A commutative justice deals with um, uh, exchanges between members of the group. And legal justice deals with what members of the group owe to, um, owe to the group. So the, the standard of justice for distributive justice is contribution and merit. So how much did you con contribute to the group and what is the merit of your contribution? Uh, commutative justice deals with exchanges and the rule of justice is that the exchanges should be equal. Uh, whereas legal justice, the rule is what is necessary for uh, good order and nothing more. So there's kind of a triangle, distributive justice, distributes to members of the group. Commutative justice is exchanges between members of the group and legal justice is what the group members owe to the group. Okay, so uh, commutative justice would be more strictly mathematical, I mean. Arithmetic, yes. Arithmetic, whereas distributed justice would be more proportional. Exactly, yes. Yeah. And so it's not simply, even with distributed justice, it's not simply what, what does a person contribute to the group, which is part of it, but it's also what is owed to one simply in virtue of being a member of the group. So there are this certain group, yes, goods which yes. are, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, th I think that's, that's, that's important to understand because, again, like I said, when we're dealing with definitions like this, they're very, often very unclear to people who may be listening to us. Mm -hmm. 
and so that precedes the next point. Um, unless someone's adds to what we said, um, but to proceed the next point, capitalism. What is capitalism? How do we define capitalism? It's I I, I sometimes think the new, capitalism is about as clear a term nowadays as socialism mm -hmm. uh, or fascism. Right? We use people use these terms, and I and oftentimes I find when I speak to people who say they're pro-capitalist, oftentimes they're not quite as pro, they don't mean the same thing by capitalism as I would mean. So maybe we could invite anybody here to give a definition. What is capitalism? And it's, I understand that there are various different ways of expressing it. I've seen that in various different writers as to what is its essence. Yeah, but there are, there are, we sort there of clear are that up. many different definitions, but I'd like to, if I may, I'd like to read one that I like to use. I think it's an authoritative one namely from Pope Pius XI, from Quadricipal Anno, number 100. And he calls it, that economic system in which were provided by different people, capital and labor, jointly needed for production. In other words, the keynote of capitalism, as Pius is saying here, is that you have one class that owns the means of production, and they hire other people to work for them. And there is necessarily a, a separation between ownership and work. And that's what I always mean by capitalism, although I realize that that's not what everybody means by it. And I, th I think you can add to that what uh, John Paul II says, is that it's, um, it asserts the priority of capital over labor. And that capital is regarded as the chief contributor to production, when in fact, there is no capital without labor. No. Don, did I see you? Um, hello. Has anybody read Chesterton's definition of capitalism? That's no, it. Read remember it, but... it. I'm sure we've read it, but do we remember it? Uh, I don't remember it. Uh, I don't have it before me, but um, I think it's in his What's Wrong with the World book. And um, he defines it as uh, that system where um, the um, most of the property is owned by a few, and uh, the majority uh, by such necessity is required to work for money at the behest of the, those who have it. Who, 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 uh, so we, he defines it in terms of property that those that uh, there is a few who own most of the property or control it, and um, the majority um, are required because of their lack of property generally um, to work for hire. And that's fairly close to what um, Thomas said uh, about it. Uh, but then he suggested that the name was inappropriate because it suggested that most people were capitalists in a capitalist system. And he said, well, most people are, are not capitalists, they're proletarians. That, that is, they, they um, lack property generally and m most of them are in debt anyway. At the time, most of their lives paying off debt so they they hardly have any property to speak of. Um, so he suggested the proper name for the system was proletarianism. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's a more accurate term. Certainly more descriptive of the majority of people, <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, I would say that it's uh, the uh, inevitable result of capitalism. Now, that's his uh, term. When you, when you have one class controlling the means of production, the other one is going to be that, yes. That's the point or, of it's distributed. Or I would say more that it's, it is the inevitable result when, as capitalists did, you decide that, that economics is no longer subject to ethics. Because then that's when it's going to happen. If, if, if that, that's, that's been my contention for quite a long time is that, you know, Capitalism could be done in 
a just way or at least a more just way if you could get capitalists to all agree that capitalism itself as a as a system is subject to ethics and and the principles of ethics now most of them will say of course you should act ethically but they'll also argue that capitalism is a completely separate system yeah i i just to add to that but the that's a result of considering uh economics as a pure physical science yes a de- a de- which was the 19th century that was the achievement of the 19th century to divorce economics and ethics where before that uh from the days of aristotle until adam smith uh you always had a, a political ethical economy and um um this divorce of uh, this this pure scientism in uh, economics creates this divorce well ethics aren't an issue it's just supply and demand charts that's all you know what what do ethics have to do with that but, but I, I, think, I would disagree with you david to some extent in that um even if you got capitalists to agree to that the tendency in capitalism since they since you have a separation of ownership and work the tendency is always toward regarding your labor as merely a cost item and you want to reduce that cost as much as possible so it's kind of working against the nature uh yeah. it's like saying oh we can put up pictures center falls and playboy and just don't look at them just avoid your eyes yeah yeah i do um, i do i do agree quite that easy i do agree with you there um as i said i ultimately it could be more just but it, i don't think it would ever be a completely just system um you know you you could make it better than it is but I don't think it would resolve all the problems. Well, I, as, as, wonder, as one person commented, it would be like, uh, if you're going to compare it to Playboy, it'd be like uh, reading Playboy with your wife turning the pages. <laughs> well, I don't think that's very edifying. <laughs> so, as a, yeah, as a, yeah, sometime, yeah. As a sometime <laughs> logic teacher... <laughs> sensitive to Christopher Zender's uh, suggestion that we really work on definitions. Let me first ask Dr. Small if he wants to get a word in edgewise here. Otherwise, I'm going to do a little bit of a riff from the logician side of things. I'd like to um, uh, broaden, I guess, the way we're looking at it. I think one of the contributions of Adam Smith, as much as he didn't make much by way of a positive contribution, was at least to um, map out the problem of distribution between the factors of production as land, labour and capital. We often forget the limitations on what capital is when we're talking about what capitalism means. Uh, capital is always some um, prior product, a tool. Um, land uh, suffers from the problem of uh, the understanding of property rights, which St Thomas devoted uh, quite a lot of attention to, and we, we often forget that when we're talking about questions of capitalism. Um, if we look at the, distributive, the, the problem of distributive justice, as the allocations between land, labour and capital. If we begin by the, with the observation that commutative justice is seldom practised, which gives us some sort of an excess back to the factors of production, land, labour and capital, it means there's always an excess and a residue. And so uh, the capitalist would like to say, I will pay land as little as I can in order to run my business and I'll take the rest. I'll pay labour as little as possible and I'll take the rest. Marx, Proudon and co came along and said, no, no, we don't want that. We don't want the capitalists to take the excess. Uh, We're going to uh, take it for the workers and uh, that hasn't worked out terribly well as much as it was probably not a bad idea. The reality in our culture pretty much through the modern era, is that we've lived in an era of absolute private property, which St Thomas also had trouble with, and so did Aristotle. Absolute private property is an abomination. 
The capitalist thinks it's natural. Aristotle didn't, neither did St. Thomas. The socialist, proud Marx and co, um, reject it in favour of the of, of, of labour. Uh, so we've we've got this this argument over over private property that's in there. Um, Henry George came along, and he wasn't a Catholic social theorist, but a lot of Catholics subscribe to his thinking. And he looks to Ricardo and said that land takes the residue, the excess. Um, capitalism is when the capitalist, the owner of capital, takes the excess. Um, the problem with ethics is that ethics is always about self-restraint, whether it's you and your wife leering over Playboy or... What? We're back to that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the um, it's always about self-restraint. Self-restraint is when uh, workers follow the advice of St. John the Baptist and give a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. Um, Self-restraint is when the capitalist doesn't overcharge um, his uh, clients, his his customers, and doesn't underpay his factors of production, principally his workers. And self-restraint is also when the landowner is humble enough to realise that he should only get a return for what he actually puts in rather than earning some speculative um, profit. And so we live in a world where we're just arguing over who takes the residue. Um, the, the, the capitalist will say, I'll take the residue, thank you very much, because I'm so important to make all this happen. The uh, labourer following the socialist says, I'll take the residue because um, I'm actually doing the work. And the landowner says, well, naturally, and uh, it, with the foibles of human nature, um, I have it anyway, and uh, you chaps can just go and argue to your heart's content, but I'm going to end up the wealthiest in the game. Um, well, a lot of cards a lot of cards have been dealt in this discussion, and Dr. Small, you've certainly added a number of them. Let me go back, before we go back to Christopher, let me go back to the logician's riff. <laughs> a little bit of a preamble to it. This past week in Trieste, uh, the Holy Father said that uh, democracy uh, is, is not doing so well. And then he went on to speak of democracy. But what he actually did in speaking about democracy was to give a persuasive or perhaps aspirational definition of democracy. And logicians even in informal logic, want to distinguish between definitions that are lexical. Uh, those are definitions that report how a word is mostly used nowadays, lexical, and, and uh, persuasive, uh, how a definition is used to persuade somebody or other to have a certain view about that which is being defined. And then, really, the gold standard is a genus and species definition, which is as Aristotelian as we can get. And the idea there is we define something in terms of identifying the genus to which it belongs and what differentiates it from other members of that genus. Now, all of this is deeply complicated, and this is all of the riff as far as I'm concerned, uh, many, many people today don't think that there are any essences, so you can't give an essential definition. <laughs> However, that's enough of that. So, Christopher, where should we continue? Well, I, this one, I just to maybe wrap this one up. I remember Amintori Fonfani um, defined capitalism as, as an economic system which is um, where all goods are subordinated to material goods to material good of profit and so or economic production is what he said so that he even said that the soviet union was the perfection of the capitalist order and um, i thought that was interesting because what we're talking about right some of the things we're discussing is that when we talk about the relationship between the, the owner the, the capitalist and his workers 
we're not talking about something in, in itself which is, is perverse. There's nothing wrong for someone to own a business and to hire people to work for them. Uh, there's nothing wrong in, in markets, I would think, right? So what makes capitalism perverse is something else. It's it's the imbalance. I guess. Would it be right to say it's an imbalance, or is it a, is it a, like Montori Fanfani said, a false orientation, a false determination of what is the the ultimate good of society? Well, I, I think you have to distinguish in the passage that I quoted. Planet Eleven goes on and says the system in itself is not uh, intrinsically wrong, and what he means by that is something that David was getting at before when he said capitalism could, in theory, operate justly, but I would maintain that, oh, that it's nearly impossible for this to happen because of, of the, of, of our fallen human nature. And so when we have power, we're apt to abuse that power. And when capitalists control the economy, they're apt to abuse that. And, and as I said, regard labor as simply a cost item to be reduced as much as possible, which is why I'm a distributist because I'd like to eliminate that, that distinction between the, um, the uh, owner and worker, and make the owner worker and worker owner. So um, that, to me, is is the yeah. It, it could operate, and on paper it could operate justly, but the examples of it are, are few and far between. All well, right, I think you that, can. That Valerie, why don't you push us forward here? Because we're we're going to dwell on each of these questions at great length, unless we have an external. An external efficient <laughs> cause come into play. All right. Well, if there's something that just has to be said, you can add it into one of the later parts of our conversation. But I don't know who wants to take this, but the corporation, the advent of the corporation, I understand marked a major shift in uh, what is economics. And so would somebody explain kind of what, what is the origin of the corporation? Why is a corp- Why is there power? Um, how how does the corporation have power in a, a unique unique way, and and is there a way to kind of confront or um, bring balance to that power that you know of? How how can we contend with that? Is it uh, well, I think that? Well, that might be Doctor Small's turf. Well, the um, corporation is a legal entity, so its history comes from law not from economics. And um, its origin, I believe, came from uh, um, the early capitalist order, um, where the few were were the lords of the land and uh, of the realm, a sort of aristocracy who could... uh, uh, own most of the property and would have what in the med- Middle Ages, of course, it was uh, serfs who did the work, who were the labourers. Uh, that system changed in the modern era, um, but not basically because uh, the le- the uh, workers, the, the serfs really were beginning to have a little bit of land of their own, which they could work in, on the manor. Uh, but they were gradually driven off that those pieces of land and became property-less. Of course, the uh, system of agriculture had changed. And uh, there was uh, quite a shift from the medieval system of distribution which was imperfect, but it it was beginning to have some beneficial effect in that uh, the yeomen that were called well, really a, it's a word that means workers of the land. The, the man of the land is a geoman. That's English becomes yeoman, and he was he was not an owner, but he had some rights to his make to uh, have his own property and land and uh, live off that. And on top of that, there was a system of common lands that he, the poor could have access to to um, eke out a, a better existence that way. 
But both those systems changed. The, the yeoman lost his strips of land when they were amalgamated into the Lord's overall estate. And then the, the, um, it, the common lands were enclosed. There was a whole period when a uh, legal enclosure which locked out the poor from that from that source of, of living as it were. So they were uh, the serfs were were certainly servile, but they became more helpless with the change. And uh, the um, shift then was uh, connected with the advances in technology and, and manufacturing and it became possible with new inventions to mass produce things uh, and uh, that um, that meant that the, the previous yeoman and uh, poor would, would, had to go into urban areas become factory workers and uh, make a wage. So that, that was the shift to the wage worker from the medieval system of serf. And in, in one way it was a, a freeing of the, of the worker. He, he was no longer tied to the land, but, but he had no tie at all except to the wage that he could make. And uh, he became uh, what eventually ended up in the late 19th century in Pope Leo XIII's description as in a condition little better than slavery. And uh, the yoke of slavery. So he was politically free, but economically dependent. And in a way, much much more cruelly dependent than before because there was no personal relationship between the worker and the and the employer as there was between the lord of the manor and his serfs. So, so sort of, they were sort of halfway between a, a family relationship and a, a, a slave relationship. But uh, the, that, that sort of personal connection was lost and the, the new system, the capitalist system, is very impersonal. The, the, the labourer uh, competes with his other labourers mm. for a price to work for the person who has the capital. And uh, that can get very, very extremely um, uh, oppressive at times, and it did in the 19th century. And, and that sparked the socialist revolution. Socialism is, didn't come before capitalism. It's a reaction to capitalism. And uh, it's, uh, it's got the features of totalitarianism, which uh, uh, in a way uh, are in the capitalist system already. That is the power an excessive power over the majority to um, um, keep them down, as it were. And that's that's what that's the description I think Chesterton gives. It it's a technical definition. It's not a moral definition. It supposes a moral lack of justice, but it's it's not a uh, uh, it's it's a an economic relationship in terms of property and labour, or capital and labour. Land comes into it indirectly, in the, insofar as you can't work or use your capital except on land. So the landowner has a certain control over what happens. But uh, land and, and the old system, the medieval system was land-based, really, that was the landlord, the lord of the land, who uh, ran the show. Mm -hmm. um, that has become now, it's, it's, uh, and the other thing that's missing is really what is in the title of the book, is money. 
is that money is regarded as capital now. It's, it's, and it's to do with the system of exchange. So that, that, uh, uh, is a complication in the definition of capital. And, uh, I've dealt with the various aspects of it in my, my books. Now, when you, uh, when you mentioned that magic word money, yeah. I think of how I wish I had some money in the bank. And, yeah. well, well Jim, basically to the, the closest bank uh, right around the corner is uh, something called the Bank of America. I don't know if there's a Bank of Australia, but there's a Bank of America. And once yeah. upon a time, my, my erstwhile quondam employer instead of a bank there, because they weren't giving out much in the way of money, had a credit union. And I guess some people have some money in a credit union. And, and then we have a, a very active member of the uh, American Solidarity Party, which you've all heard of, and I, of course, support, uh, uh, who, who helps to manage a public bank, a public bank. A French fellow, John, Norm Schwinard. At any rate, maybe some of you folks could help us distinguish between the Bank of America, your friendly or more friendly, isn't it, credit union, and what we maybe wish there were a lot more of, public banks. Well, Jim, before we do that, would you mind if I said something uh, in regard to Valerie's questions about the origin of corporations? Yes, go ahead, please. We yeah. can well, I'll just be, I'll try to be brief. I can't speak to any other country, but in the United States, before the, roughly the Civil War, corporations were generally small things, started chartered by state legislatures to do specific things, for example, operate a bridge or operate a steamboat between uh, two ports. And they had a kind of a monopoly, but they were restricted both as to what they could do and, and as to how long your charter would last, which would might or might not be renewed by, by the legislature. Starting with the 14th Amendment, which was designed to, to uh, benefit the freed slaves, the corporations took a huge power grab and they started calling, they said that uh, they were persons under the 14th Amendment, which eventually the Supreme Court recognized. And they began, they, they achieved rights to perpetuity instead of being chartered for a certain number of years, they, they were forever. They achieved rights to do anything they wanted uh, instead of just operate one particular thing, they achieve rights to own another corporation, like a holding company, and um, basically they uh, slowly, gradually achieve the prominence that they have in our economy today. But it's been a lot. In fact, it, that uh, Citizens United case, which was in the last twenty years, was one of the latest power grabs on the part of corporations uh, to to have all the rights but few of the liabilities. Of natural persons. So it was really, as, as Don said, it was a legal, a legal fact, not an economic fact. Uh, they, they manipulated the economic, the legal process. And um, so a corporation, if you do something wrong, you might go to prison. If a corporation does something wrong, well, probably at most, it'll be fined. And they won't actually, the officers and directors won't actually go to prison. That's what it's a limited liability. I mean, it would have to be a very, very gross uh, criminal act for them to actually go to jail. So a corporation is essentially a collective group of people investing uh, and that they none of them carry the, the liability or the risks individually. It's this kind of group holding and they don't they aren't responsible in the same way a, a, an individual is in terms of the law. I right. And they're that's, really that's that's exactly the essence is that the corporation divorces ownership and responsibility. So if you own property, if you own a car and it you it rams into somebody's house, you are liable for whatever the damages are. If the corporate the corpor corporation and the owners of the corporation have no liability whatsoever beyond maybe losing the value of their shares. But they have no, um, so that's the whole meaning of limited liability corporations. So ownership, management, and use are all separated. And what this enables is, what this enables is, is the rise of a managerial class. Because the funny thing about capitalism is that for the most part, most capitalists don't have very, very much power. The power is all in the hands of a 
professional managerial class. Uh, and so that's where the real elite uh, comes from. Uh, uh, is the managers of the property, not that, not that, not the owners. Of, most owners don't even know what the hell they own because they own it through uh, uh, a fund or something like that. Um, so uh, uh, ownership, responsibility, knowledge, exactly. Yes, uh, I think you have to be careful to um, uh, factor into that analysis the uh, portions. Many people might own a microscopic share in a corporation, but in the concentration of wealth that's been happening over the same era means that there is a very small number, a very small percentage of the population that actually do have influence. And you're right, managerial class exercises apparent um, power and influence. Uh, but that concentration of wealth, I think, is is key to understanding capitalism. Mm-hmm. All right, let's, let's, yeah. let's, let's pivot back here, uh, but we could bring the threads of the conversation uh, into play. Sh- should we maybe speculate that uh, most bankers are almost as bankrupt as I am? Uh, should we speculate that most <laughs> bankers are... are uh, uh, wondering why they have to follow the orders they have from their managers. Uh, how, how, let's take banks as a testing ground for what we've said so far about capitalism, uh, about uh, corporate ownership. Uh, uh, yeah, what about banks? They're on well, the, I, I, would start off. Off. I would start off by, by because the, the bank versus credit union versus personal bank question segues right off the topic of corporation because the banks are the corporations that have that managerial class that control everything. Whereas, you know, at least historically credit unions were worker based institutions within a particular industry or even within a particular company that they would collectively pool their economic resources and through that support each other. So I know, I know there are other people in the panel who could certainly go more into depth and a better answer than I am. But to me, that that's kind of the segue directly from the corporation question into the banks versus the other options question. I think you're right. The uh, the banks are probably, well, obviously, they're financial institutions, but corporations are also primarily financial institutions. They're not really interested in the products they produce or the services they provide. They're interested in maximising their shareholders' wealth, maximising profit. That's purely finance. And one of the curiosities when you get closer and closer to finance is that in finance, you're not interested in production and goods and serving human needs and all the other things economists talk about. You're interested in maximising your financial returns, your profits. And so the banks do that. that. That's why Heinrich Pesch, the Jesuit, who was largely the inspiration for Protegis Moana, defined capitalism as state-sponsored usury. And uh, usury is, is, is really one of the, the key issues behind all of this. Yeah, I um, think this- usury doesn't get nearly enough attention because uh, finance is such um, a fundamental aspect of any production. All production is a process in time. There's always a, a gap between the planting and the harvest, between, you know, the raw material and the finished product. So all production has to be financed, which is going to give finance a key um, power in the system. But when finance uh, gets more than it contributed, um, then you have usury, and usury gathers more and more wealth into fewer and fewer hands, okay? And capitalism is always going to follow the course of usury. Okay, because the finance function is so critical to any production, 
okay, any production. Um, but it doesn't get nearly the attention, uh, either the economic attention or the moral attention, um, the political attention that it deserves. In fact, we don't even like to use the term usury today. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing that, that most people don't realize is that the vast majority of our money supply is created by the private banking system. 95%, created, yeah. Created as debt, which then uh, is required to be paid back to the banks with interest, uh, which interest is 100% usury. Um, and it's, it's people think of, the, oh, the, the money supply is the, the paper money that I have in my wallet or maybe the gold Fort Knox or whatever. But no, that's just a minuscule part of their money supply. Most of the money supply is created by banks and created as debt. And uh, probably this isn't a good time to go into this in detail how that works, but uh, I've tried to explain it to people. Sometimes I found people have a hard time grasping that point. Well, well Henry, Ford, Henry Ford once said that if, if people understood the process of creating money, there would be a revolution before breakfast. Uh, he was wrong because if you tell people how money is created, they won't revolt. They simply won't believe you. They can't, can't believe that. They wouldn't believe that. Or, or <laughs> such a system. I'll join the process by buying some stock. Christopher, uh, you, you were presenting us with a, a benign, ordinary sort of capitalism that surely there'd be nothing wrong with. Uh, I, I wonder, could we go back to the sort of uh, image that you had in mind? Was there anything there that involved usury? Or were you thinking of something that would not be usurious? Perhaps uxorious, but not usurious. I wasn't actually thinking in terms of the finance aspect of that when we were discussing it. I think it though it might be helpful. I, I, I know I, I know this is tedious with me, but it might be helpful if um, we defined usury because again, those people who are going to be listening to us don't usually use the term, or they think usury is, ex- is just excessive interest, but it's not the excessive interest. What is usury? Well, it's any interest charged on a loan simply by virtue of its being a loan. No matter what the purpose of the loan is for, whether it's for you know, to buy a yacht or whether it's to start a business, if I charge somebody interest purely on the basis of that they're loaning me money, I'm loaning them money, rather, um, then that's usury. I, 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 I think I have a little difficulty with that because insofar as anybody contributes capital to uh, some venture, they have a right to return on that capital that they create. So that's in itself not the problem. It's The problem is when they, one, they don't really contribute anything but a legal right. That is, the banks just create money. They do not lend out money. If I lend Thomas Stork, you know, $1,000 to start a business, Thomas needs to pay me back the $1,000 and to let me participate in whatever the profits of that business are. But if I just invent the money, well, that's not the same thing, okay, as me taking money, having less money and you having more. Uh, So in in that sense, all interest from a bank loan is certainly dubious. Um, The bank is entitled to some return for one, the business of making the loan and the risk that you won't pay back and... uh, uh, things like uh, and the cost of servicing the loan, all of that, the bank is entitled to something. Well, I, ag- I agree with that. And I think the main issue there is the source of the return. Because like what you said, when you know you loan money to Thomas and, and you have you are entitled to a share of the profit. That's right. Mm-hmm. But the way we do our loans in in our current capitalist society that's not how it is well wait a minute wait a minute the, the return you the return you get is based off the money that was loaned to you and it's an interest charge against money so even if thomas doesn't get any profit you still do because because your return as the lender is not based on the success of the business you don't have the same risk 
that he has, you're protected from risk because he owes you interest based on the money loaned. And that's really where the issue is in usury by my understanding. No, that's exactly what I what I was trying to say. So John, if you if you buy money for my business venture and you have and you kind of buy a share in it, yes, you're entitled to to a return on that. But on the other hand, if the business fails, which if, if I were running it it probably would, um, then uh, <laughs> you would uh, you would not get anything back. But Sure. As David said, simply because if, if, if the business fails and you still expect to get your money back, that's usury. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we're just maybe saying the same thing in slightly different ways. A, a useful way of understanding this, I mean, we're, we're really coming close to including explicitly the element of risk. Most of the 20th century uh, in the finance area has been devoted to justifying, explaining the risk-free element of, um, of of an interest loan, of a money loan. And that although, really claiming, although claiming that they're still taking a risk. Well, the, the, the relative scale of the risk is, is negligible. If um, I borrow money from the bank to buy a house, uh, they only see their risk starting when I'm not able to pay all my principal and accumulated interest back to them which is a long way down the track, especially if the bank only lends me 50, 80% of, 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 the, of the value, um, they're, they're very well protected. Whereas if I'm using that property for a business, a uh, farm or whatever, um, the, 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 the risk is really no proportion. Let, let me interject this. Valerie, will you join me in asking these gentlemen these worthy gentlemen, uh, since we only have three minutes left, if they'd be willing to stay with us for another 15 minutes. What do you think, I, gentlemen? I, I'm available for as long yes. as you're running this. Yes, I'm, 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 I can stay. Well, well Valerie, since, it's, since, it's Valerie, since it's Valerie asking, I'll stay. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that, that if, Jim, if Jim had asked... Jim had asked, I wouldn't have, have done that. No. <laughs> All right. Way to go, Valerie. <laughs> I feel like you. BNHO, BNHO. Now, since we have an extension of 15 minutes, I don't think we'd want more. But since we have the 15 minutes, would you ask the next question? You bet. So we hear a lot about wage issues, minimum wage, just wage. Um, market wage uh, help us make sense of you know kind of these categories of, of and how they relate a market wage a just wage and um, what was the third one that I just said fair minimum, wage. Minimum wage. fair wage well, yeah. that's what we get that's what we get <laughs> okay well I, I think I the best definition I've ever ever heard of a market wage I, I have to give credit to Thomas because he that's where I got it from, is that it's it's the lowest wage that they can get away with paying. Um, that's that's the market wage. And what in my examination uh, of that definition, I came to realize that the market that you're competing in isn't just your industry in your uh, area or even your country the market you're actually competing with is essentially the entire world. Um, so if there's someplace else in the world, even in a communist country, that's offering a wage low enough that they can earn a greater profit, making it there and shipping it here, um, then that determines what the market wage is that you have to compete with. Uh, the minimum wage is an attempt at rectifying this that is noble but imperfect because it's usually implemented at a state level and it doesn't take into account the different costs of living uh, in different areas, even within the own one state. Um, you can establish a minimum wage that would leave a person destitute in a metropolis, but have them living in the lap of luxury 
uh, in a more rural area. Um, whereas the church's teaching on a just wage really takes into account the locality of where you're living and says that a just wage is that if, if you are a person who is working full time, you should earn enough to be able to support your family. And that's, David, that's the, the basis of it. David, if you, if, as long as you have mobility of capital, as you were saying yourself, you're competing against the whole world. If you pay workers in the uh, rural area uh, less than they do in the metropolitan or vice versa, then it, that's an incentive for the, for the corporation to move their, their um, production to the uh, lower wage area. Which is not yes. a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Well, if we got some more. If we got some more business, and you know, uh, uh, move some from New York and Philadelphia out to Butte and Des Moines, that would not be such a bad thing. Well, in my opinion, what it ends up doing is it it incentivizes the corporations to place their business in the large metropolitan areas because the people be, are more dependent on them there. Yeah, and so, there's actually a. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's actually an anomaly there that the cities should be the most efficient places to keep people. And so they should be the places where people are wealthiest. But that tends to be negated by the, the cost of real estate. It costs about the same to ship a can of beans to some rural town as it does to put it in the middle of um, New York. And it's more efficient to take a truckload of of cans of beans to to New York than, you know, a a handful um, to some little town. But the cost of rent, um, sort of no comparison. And that is an extra level of complexity um, that, that is often ignored, these sort of comparisons. Yes, and I think it's ignored because land disappeared as a separate category in economics at the start of the 20th century. So there used to be land, labor, and capital, and that's how people thought about economics. In the 20th century, it was just capital and labor, and land dis- disappeared into the capital fund when, of course, that's nonsense. It has an entirely different mathematics. But I also want to point out, and I think it's very important, that low wages are just bad economics because each firm's wage bill is every other firm's demand curve. Okay, So the wages that uh, Thomas pays to Christopher is the money that Christopher can use to buy goods from David and John, you know? So low wages necessitates government intervention into the economy to because the government is forced, is forced to become the consumer of last resort. Okay, so the government has to buy battleships and uh, welfare and uh, big bureaucracies because nobody else can is has enough to absorb all the output. Uh, so low wages and big government sort of go together. Um, Otherwise, the whole system collapses. And Gary pointed out, alluded a minute ago to uh, Heinrich Pesch, the uh, the Jesuit economist, and uh, he had a very, very interesting theory about wages, namely that since the labor of one person is generally, if he has the right tools and and the right amount of land, it's generally enough to support not only himself, but several other people, when a person is not paid that 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 indicates a mis, some kind of a uh, uh, lack of balance and mismanagement between those who control the payment and the actual worker, which is again one of the reasons that capitalism is a, a social evil because you have levels of complexity that contribute to this. Whereas when you have a, uh, a, a distributist economy or something approaching to that then the levels of complexity uh, are not there. And the, and the relationship between the ability of a worker to generate income and the income that he receives is much, much clearer and much more direct. 
So if, if y'all owned a company or if you, you know, I, there's probably listeners that own a small business. Like how do they, what's your, what's your recommendation to them in terms of how to provide a just wage considering all the complexities, you know, well, you have thoughts for them. But yeah, but um, in a way, yes. I asked the eleventh was well aware, and he said that in the capitalist economy, employers were often in a bind because their competitors were not paying just wages, and if they wanted to compete with them uh, or even stay in business, not necessarily increase their market share, but just stay in business, they they were in a real bind because their workers uh, they were trying to pay a just wage, and their um, their workers, the other people weren't. This is in Davini Reign of Taurus. Now, what did he, Pius said that they have a duty, the employers have a duty in social justice to work to change the system so that, in fact, uh, it is possible to pay the, the, the wage due in commutative justice. But unfortunately, at least in the United States, I can't speak anywhere else, uh, business owners have absolutely no sense that they have any responsibility to ensure justice in the economy. Uh, at most, it would be a matter of, of a personal relationship with their uh, employees. And in that case, when they do have the resources to pay a just wage, they're duty bound to do so, even if it cuts into their own profits, because they're, the most they have a right to is a, a sense of wage, uh, and, uh, just like their employees. Mm-hmm. Well, let me point out, I mean, the, 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 that's the key issue is that it's really not up to the individual employer for the most part. It's a systemic question. And that's why Quadro Jesi Moano made it a systemic <laughs> issue. Uh, so the uh, employer doesn't always get to choose. Sometimes he does, but mostly he doesn't get to choose. And so systemic reform is required. And what are the systemic reforms? Well, they have to be aimed at balancing the power between employers and employees. Because Adam Smith pointed out that Wages are a result of power <laughs> negotiations. And so long as one side has all the power, there will not be just wages. So um, things that help to increase the power of labor are things like labor unions, guilds, uh, minimum wages, imperfect as they are. Uh, all of these things increase the bargaining power of labor and where the power between both sides is more or less equal, probably the result will be a just wage. But as long as there's an imbalance of power, there can never be a just wage. Now, getting back to the, excuse me, getting back to the American Solidarity Party, which I know you're all secretly thinking about, wish I'd discuss more openly. I have a yard sign, a beautiful yard sign that says, Satsuki Onak, American Solidarity Party, pro-life, pro-family, and pro-worker. We've talked some about workers. We haven't spoken directly about life. We should at least speak about the family. We want to say in Catholic social thought uh, that the family is the core unit of society. And John Paul II, uh, I don't know if anybody before him, but John Paul II yeah. definitely spoke of the need for family politics. Uh, we don't have much time left, and I wanted to get that in. So whoever wants to comment, please do. Yeah, so I think you make a good point. We really live in two economies, is one way of looking at it. That we, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 someone sort of goes down to breakfast, uh, uh, a schoolboy. He doesn't lay his visa card on the uh, dining room table uh, to, to get breakfast, uh, his, his parents give it to him. And as a result, he gives them a lot of things in return. There's a gift economy that is core in the family. And there's a notion of justice and purpose and proportionality. Uh, you go outside the front door and you're living in a contract economy where it's a, it's a taking economy, it's not a giving economy. Uh, one of the curiosities of, of the early social encyclicals, not so evident in the later ones, was that the answer, you go to the back of Rerum Navarum and you, you might be looking for economic policy advice or something. It's evangelization. The same thing at the end of um, Potter Moeno. 
and, and there is a almost an irony that on one hand what we call catholic social thought is really an outline of how creation works how, how how human nature is meant to work socially but the irony is that in order to achieve it you need the players especially those with power whether they've got uh, union power or um, money power or, or whatever it is those in power to choose the good rather than self-interest and and most of the capitalist era the last 500 years roughly has been an attempt to justify greed as a virtue and we see this all the way through greed is good uh, probably the most recent kind of uh, example of it and uh, when Mason Gaffney wrote about the corruption of economics, especially focusing on American economic, the development of American economic thought, it, it had this, this chorus that the people that were funding the economics professors were the people that had grown rich on capitalism. So it provided a, a kind of form of uh, moral justification, whereas the alternative is to put God first. And and that's very awkward because in our era, the Protestant ethic, which really was the genesis of capitalism, uh, gave us the, the first idea that we get to define our own moral order, whereas humans have to exist within the reality. Um, and that's what Catholic social thought really attempts to, to expose. What is the reality or what is the necessity that we're working amongst? Uh, a profound realization. I, I wonder, uh, just to add to that, I mean, it, the the use economy and the exchange economy and the use economy is almost always a gift economy, um, um, almost by necessity. But when we saw this big transition of women um, from the home uh, sphere to the work sphere. So uh, we saw this huge increase in GDP, okay? But it wasn't real because all, the only thing that was happening was that so-called women's work, if I may put it that way, was being monetized. So when mama cooks meal for the family, GDP doesn't change. But when mama takes the family out to McDonald's, okay, <laughs> GDP goes up. <laughs> But there was no real increase in output. It was the same number of meals, whether Mama did it or the fry cook at McDonald's did it. So, and that's, uh, we had this uh, huge, huge increase in GDP, but no real increase in output. So our way of measuring the economy through GDP itself is corrupt because it only measures the exchange economy. It doesn't even recognize the existence of the use economy. And, and this isn't even really an issue of women having economic earning potential because in the past, there used to be home industries that wives and mothers could participate in and actually earn income for the family while simultaneously taking care of the home. Mm -hmm. and, and capitalism came in and used its economic power to change legislation to illegalize a lot of those home businesses and basically say, well, you can produce cloth for your home, but you can't sell it. Mm -hmm. And and that is basically took away a, a significant economic source for families in the past and drove women out of the home into the factories making the same cloth that they used to make at home, although cheaper because it was industrialized. Um, and, and that is another aspect. And this is really just a whole shift of the notion of how economy fits into home management, which is actually the root meaning of the term. You know, you know, economy used to be, you know, how you manage the, the, the financial needs of the home. And it has now become, you know, how we manage the financial success of the nation. 
and how we define success has changed to simply mean how much we produce and how much people, how much corporations profit from it. Oh, I think that's illustrated in history too, that um, the end of the 15th century, the average worker in England was producing something like three and a half times his um, sort of needs, his consumption needs. You move forward into through through the uh, the 16th century. Uh, by the time you get to the end of it, the average worker in England was actually producing less than his income needs, and the standard of living was going down. And that was happening all through the maturation of of um, mercantile then industrial capitalism. The GDP was increasing, but the standard of living for the vast majority of uh, the impl- uh, of the population you see this especially in England. Uh, was, was actually falling to the point where you know my country was populated by convicts and their warders because uh, the Englishmen and Irishmen and Scotsmen couldn't afford to feed their families. And you had the most economically successful country on earth, well, maybe apart from the United States, uh, but you know through the era of the uh, British Empire, uh, the great majority of the people were living in abject poverty. It was you know, absurd. Uh, that, that's the, um, the, the, the the problem of, of, of um, uh, the, the modern um, misuse of, of private industry, private property. But, but GDP was going up, so it's okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, the economy is strong. We've come to the end of our extra time, and I know that you will all be invited back, and I know that you all have a lot more to say. Uh, but that'll require a whole other episode. And since we've had 285 episodes already on the open door, you know that we're a very episodic enterprise and that we will be inviting you back. But now it's time to end, and and we end whatever we speak about. Well, did you see the, the uh, message that Sebastian just sent? He said, plug the book. So we should mention the book. Could you repeat that again? I'm not. I'm not going to be distracted by that follow. But go ahead, repeat it again. So Sebastian, uh, Sebastian sent a little chat. I guess you call it, saying, "Plug the book." So maybe we should just mention it at least. John's holding it up there. Ah, okay. Money markets. That's the book. Uh, listen, uh, book. <laughs> listen. Uh, uh, I don't think that. I don't think that Sebastian is motivated by capitalism. I think he's motivated by a, a true love for the common good. And then, all right, mark it away, dude, mark it away. The money, uh, money market uh, on, that, on that enterprising yes. note, on that enterprising note, in passing over in silence that among many master's degrees that Sebastian has, he's about to add one in marketing. Uh, <laughs> We're, we're going to end with with the scripture for the day. And actually, in honor of Australia, we're ending with the gospel for tomorrow. It's the uh, Feast of St. Benedict, who certainly had an economics in practice, and uh, it's an economics that uh, uh, greatly affected the whole of church life and greatly benefited the family. So uh, the reading... For the gospel for tomorrow is from Matthew. Jesus said to his apostles, As you go, make this proclamation. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Without cost, you have received. Without cost, you are to give. Do not take gold or silver or copper for your belts. No sack for the journey or a second or sandals or a stick. The laborer says keep. Whatever town or village you enter, look for a worthy person in it. Stay there until you leave. As you enter a house, which your peace. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If not, Peace return to you. 
whoever will not receive you or listen to your words, go outside that house or town and shake the dust from your feet. Amen, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thanks so much. Dr. Bowen, you didn't, you didn't get your last words in. Darn, yeah. You'll have to have the first words on our next episode since you didn't get your last words in on this one. I just asked everybody to read question 77 of the second part of the second part of the summer. That's a sibilant suggestion. Yeah. 78 is on usury. All right. Now, there is this, this item in, in Aquinas where he says, you can't buy what doesn't exist. And, and when I read that, I, I thought mm. about the commodity exchange market and, and buying but, futures, buying futures on soybeans. Soybeans don't exist. 77 explains all about money making. All right. Okay. You know, I'm going to look it up. All right. <laughs> Thank you all. God Thank you. Thanks. God's made good friends. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.